welcome to the show. I'm really excited to be here and have this chat. Yeah, yeah let's do it. We were just talking off uh, microphone about our plants. Um, I only have a few because I only buy plants on sale because they tend to die. But when you name your plants, that's a good idea. I should do that. Yeah, well, this plant is actually named after a, a character, uh, Janet from the show The Good Place, my my umbrella plant oh, right here. Nice. And the whole right. thing is that Janet gets rebooted in the show. Um, and so the whole scheme was, we when we got this, we were not sure we were going to be able to keep it alive. And so the name Janet was, even <laughs> if it dies and we have to replace it, we can still keep it named Janet because cause it's just rebooting it. And of course, that means this planet has lived and thrived for like two years now. I love uh, it. No problems. So that's perfect. <laughs> Name the plants according to how you're going to care for them. That's <laughs> or they or they show their personalities. I love yeah. it. Um, I named my car. Is that weird or is that? No, not? I feel like that's very common. Okay, I used to think that's weird, especially for some of my girlfriends that have the minivans. And I'm like, really? I have a minivan, but that's not the car we named. We named my husband's car the Black Pearl because it's black on the outside and white on the inside. And it just seems like that was a good name. <laughs> I don't know what I would name my minivan, but uh, it's okay. It just, <laughs> I don't feel as connected to the van. Um, very purposeful. Okay, well, here we are. It's Friday, and I cannot wait to get to meet you. Um, you have had such an impressive background um, with your law studies and your schools that you've attended. Let's go before school, though, and get started. You had mentioned that your parents were in the industry. Did they help show you what was available or get sparked your idea about working in the space industry? Well, it's funny because I actually took a really roundabout, crazy way to become a, a space policy analyst. Uh, but yes, they, they were both aerospace, or still are aerospace engineers. And so growing up, I like to say I was very space adjacent. Um, uh -huh. saw lots of different space activities. We watched a lot of the show Nova saw at least one shuttle launch, um, but m my challenge was that I am a very artsy person and was a super artsy kid, and they are both very engineering engineers. Oh. So I you know, looked at space through the lens of, oh, this is a, a math and science thing. This is not really for me in terms of my, my future, my career, and so growing up, I, I loved politics and languages and talking to people. So I knew I wanted to go to international relations. Cool. And I went to college. My, my undergraduate degree was focused on the Middle East. Um, wow. I was not a space person at all, uh, basically until the, the end of my bachelor's degree. Um, and then at that point, I had an epiphany. I was in a, like a happy hour conversation or something right before I started graduate school. And I somehow got very deep into a personal TED talk about orbital debris and, and how I was upset that all of the policy people that I talked to, none of them thought about space. None of them really talked about policy as it relates to space. And so that's when the, the light bulb went off is, oh, if I'm so upset that no policy people are talking about space, then maybe I should be a policy person who talks about space. Hey. And okay. That's, when, yeah, wow. <laughs> so it all stemmed from a talk. Wow. I mean, truly really a, a conversation where I monologued so, so fiercely that I realized I was deeply passionate in a way that I hadn't realized I was before. What setting was that in? Was it just in, just casually or was it in a debate team yeah, it, was, or just... it was truly i think it was a happy hour uh for a, a seminar and oh i was gosh. talking to people about dream jobs and things we're passionate about and somehow i was just guys we've really got to worry about orbital debris it's it's fast it's up there what are the policy solutions and got got some some blank stares and so that was i was like no i need to wow I am so impressed and good for you for being so in tuned to like listening to yourself and saying, I'm just realizing how passionate we're in that moment. Did you like have a shortness of breath and your temperature went up and like, did you feel it as well? It was, 
I, if there was the reality of having a light bulb over my head, it would have turned on uh, from really? the, the electricity of the, the aha moment. Wow. I think it's rare to have such a, a, a switch flipped in, in your brain suddenly to be, oh, I, maybe I need to completely change the, the focus in my career path and, and figure oh out how to navigate gosh. that. <laughs> well, let's, let's be so brave as to even say, maybe we've had light bulb moments, but it takes your, you really have to be in tune with yourself to recognize that that's happening or that's your moment too, because, or maybe there's been little snippets along the way that have led you to the moment where you finally are like, there it is. And I think that the timing was a big part of it too, because I was, I was in between schools you know I, I was just about to start start the new degree program so I think it was helped my realization that I was able to immediately you know follow that path and that it wasn't a, that I was in the middle of a commitment to something else you know wow so you were in between college going into grad school yes I yeah I did them kind of back to back in a, a combined program so I was just I was weeks away from heading out the door to Italy for my first year of grad school so. oh wow grad school in Italy that's amazing what did you study there <laughs> international relations has been my my top line degree for for both the bachelor's and the master's degree and it's just the the first year that was in Italy, you come back to uh, your second year for, for Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, the challenge is, is that they don't have a space policy program. Right. So I had to MacGyver my whole space <laughs> education. I was gonna say, I, how did you do that? <laughs> I, basically every class I took, if there was a research paper at the end, it was how do I make a research paper that is technically about this class, but also about space. Yes, the smart ones, you and I have both done that. And even though I was journalism masters, I was like, and I'm gonna journalism study NASA as a case study. So I, I snuck mine in there as well. So I would be amiss if I didn't ask you, Robin, how, how did your world studies and how do they continue to impact where we are in space exploration. It must be so uniquely, incredibly observant of you to be able to say, well, you know, Italy and is part of ESA. And so they have, you know, their agency combined with a lot of other countries. It's very different from the US and our approach. And then there's Russia and all the other countries that have their space programs. But did your international studies really showcase for you a way in which they look at space exploration differently or similarly? The biggest reason that I even like international relations in the first place, the reason I went into it is because I love how there are so many different perspectives around the world or even within the same organization, within families, all of these different groups of people. Whenever you have people, there are gonna be different perspectives. And international, international relations was a way to look at how do you bridge different perspectives? How do you find mm -hmm. common ground? How do you work for positive activities together? And so space is really just the perfect outlet to apply that kind of mindset that even though we think about space and space exploration as being so high technology, so focused on engineering and, and math and science, but ultimately the people doing the engineering, the math and science are people. Yeah. And so therefore space challenges are people challenges. Uh, yeah. And you're gonna need people who can bridge those gaps, find the links, make connections on a, on a human level and not just on a technological level. And so that was what I loved so much as I was going through my education and looking into the field. Wow. Well, before we get in some more, into some more of the international aspect, which I can't wait to really jump into some more, I want to go back to how you started. You had mentioned that you were really, really artsy. What were some of the creative arts that you enjoyed that you had in school and your mindset was around? Was it uh, like a painting, everything. drawing, all of it, music? Yes, uh, I had done all sorts of those things growing up. I had two disastrous years trying to learn the saxophone in elementary <laughs> school. Uh, I was in choir, was in theater. Uh, I was actually, I've been in improv comedy uh, since I was in high school. And cool. 
continue that. Um, but I, I minored in visual arts in college. So I, there's, I still do art today, um, and both drawing and pastel. And I mean, if, if the word's art in it, I probably have at least tried it, if not succeeded. <laughs> That's so great. Not always the, the most successful, but. <laughs> well, look how many astronauts are also artists. And especially lately, I mean, at first you could only point to two, like Alan Bean and a couple others, and now the poets and the artists and the people who can capture their experience in an art form. They're just so talented. And, and it's amazing to see that balance of someone that can be so uh, left brained and system based and think about, you know, how they have to work through their journey in space and get ready to technically go and then be able to express that and share that. Did you happen to see when um, William Shatner flew? I and did, he returned yes. And he couldn't find the words and he was just, you know, overwhelmed by the overview effect. What did you think of that? It was very uh, emotional for me, just seeing someone respond, especially someone who hasn't been training for the position of being an astronaut that you, you do a lot mentally, physically to prepare yourself. But, but William Shatner was playing a role in, in space uh, for, for decades. And that's a very different kind of, of preparation. Um, so as someone who I don't necessarily have any plans to, to do the kind of training to become a professional astronaut, that's not quite my wheelhouse. But I know if I ever get to go to space, I, I think I probably will have the same gobsmacked reaction that, that Oh, sure. Did. Yeah, me too. And even as a professional communicator, I promise you, my words will be all over the board, not making sense. It's just so much to take in. But if you could, would you bring something up that would mm -hmm. express, like, would you prefer an art or um painting like is there something you would love to bring with so that you can capture that moment or express it in some way well when i do space drawings my my favorite is always to use black paper and do pastel on that oh. um so that's probably the approach i would take that's the the one that i took with the karina nebula drawing that i have behind me um it's, it's one where you don't have to be precise you can kind of be smushing the the pastels around with your hands and and that works well when you're emotional and taking things in yeah. that you don't necessarily have to have a, a steady precise hand oh that's great i can't quite see it can you point it out for us i'd love to see yes. it uh, oh right there my shoulder right here oh yeah. my gosh it's beautiful it's big Thank too you. it's a it's a monster it's, it's not quite done yet um <laughs> oh that's amazing so great. Okay, so now let's jump back. I love it, the arts. And um, you know, a liberal arts student myself, and it's like you find the ways you want to get into the depths of what you want to study. So I love that you did that with your work as well. And I love that your parents had that engineering background too, so that you had that um in in the background for you, or at least it was exposed and allowed you to see that side of it as well. Did they That's ever- One of the other kind of communication gaps I've always had to bridge is that engineers communicate very differently than a lot of say liberal arts majors. And I'd like to say, I speak just enough engineer to be, <laughs> I was raised by them or understanding the left brain mode of thinking. Really? And if I myself am maybe more right brain has been really helpful in working in an industry where many people are, are STEM focused, are engineers, et cetera. Oh, wow. Well, thank you, parents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Really. Um, I have a very left brained approach. My daughter is very, very left brain. And so sometimes I find myself choosing my words to communicate with her in that way, because she's very, she loves things that are defined and have things that are um not gray and so the <laughs> more and if i even make if i allude to something or if i reference something vaguely there needs to be clarification did you find that in your field too like can't just say i i'm i'm thinking tomorrow we're gonna do such and such. nope they need times and dates and objectives and goals <laughs> it's very different yeah, it, being a, a policy analyst means that a lot of the, the papers I write are 
well, here's a full range of options. Here are your strengths and weaknesses. I don't have a perfect solution for you because policy is, is, is really hard. And there's so many different aspects that go into it. It's not just, you know, find X, here, here we go. This is the, the mathematical answer. Um, but there's a lot of ways to combine the two um, for greater synergy that if you can use quantifiable examples, numbers, even just other ways of representing the, the same information, uh, it really helps to, to convey the point more effectively than if I write you know, five pages dancing around the same concept. There might be one graph that I could use that really helps to, to drive a point home, even in a, a policy paper. So that's, that's a big benefit of um, where I work at the Aerospace Corporation is that there are so many engineers and technical experts that I can talk to, bounce ideas off of, and help translate from one side to the other. That's a, a really big part of, of what I do that I love. That's amazing. Do a lot of the engineers then in turn and scientists come to you and say, what if, and what if, do they ask you that too? I mean, I work with a bunch of space nerds. I'm a space nerd. We all, all, all day, if there's a topic that you can riff on, that it's going to be done. <laughs> and then when you do um, work within the policy, do you pull from mostly previous cases or previous examples? Or is there sometimes not a lot to pull from and you have to pull from something that has not yet existed? So this is actually a, a really good example from a paper that I published just a couple weeks ago uh, to demonstrate how you sometimes have to cobble together all of these different approaches. So my big focus within space policy is norms of responsible behavior, which is basically how do you get everyone to, to play nice in space? How do you get mm. folks to even agree what kinds of behaviors are responsible or not? And then how do you get follow through on that? And so my most recent paper, um, I, I'm a big pun gal. So the, the word I like to use is normentum. Um, so how do you build normentum? This like new that. paper is called commercial normentum because it was specifically looking at commercial space actors and how they might have a, a nexus to security related challenges in space and how norms in turn might help to, to mitigate some of those challenges. And so for the paper, the, the first step is kind of to explore what are potential threats that commercial actors might face in space. And that's really hard to just say, well, here's the list because it hasn't been fully demonstrated or it's hard to point to uh, you know, a, a trend line or a series of, of examples. And so what I did was, uh, first of all, I pulled from other domains. So, I looked at um, the case of anti-personnel landmines um, on, on Earth, and that was the question of what do you do when you have these weapons that can last for decades? They're a lot harder to find and get rid of than they are to create in the first place. They're indiscriminate. You know, anyone could get hurt, and whole swaths of land might get kind of negated by the presence of those weapons. And how might that be a comparison from both a, a concern standpoint and a response standpoint to orbital debris, which very similarly is, is indiscriminate. It's a lot harder to get rid of than it is to make. Sure. And it can last for decades yeah. and make whole parts of space unusable. And so, so that was one example of pulling from not space to try to figure out what we could know about space. But then there are other specific signals, examples, one-off cases, uh, the recent uh, Russian anti-satellite test where they destroyed one of their own satellites in November was then an example of um, how much other satellites had to maneuver out of the way of that debris for months and will have to do so for years afterwards. Really? So by cobbling together all of these different examples from other domains, from space, from history, from theory, then you can kind of build a picture of what things might look like going forward. And at the very least, why we should be concerned about certain things and think about responses more proactively. Mm, I love that word, normentum. What a <laughs> great word. So are you trying to establish a study of the ethics of what should be done then? and apply that 
it's not necessarily a question of ethics. Of course, if you get into the liberal arts, then ethics, morals, law, semantics. The way that I define norms of behavior and what my true focus on is general agreement on what behaviors are acceptable and unacceptable. So the, the acceptable is important because it's, it's a little distinct from the term, you know, morally or ethically good but is the idea of what is responsible to do, what is feasible to do, and what can we convince other countries, companies, satellite operators around the world to do in order to make space more safe, sustainable, secure, and stable in the future. How do we do that? Does that only come with policy or is that something we can, the US should be required to set the example of regardless of policy or are we going on good faith? How in the world do you start that? So, I mean, read my paper is my first, uh, <laughs> and of course you'll get to the end of the paper and go, well, you didn't solve the problem for me. But uh, my approach has always been that there's no one size fits all solution, that there are many, many different ways to tackle these kinds of problems in space. And, and you should be approaching a lot of them um, because not all will work. Uh, many approaches take very different time spans. So trying to get an international treaty on a certain kind of behavior is going to take a lot longer than a single country announcing that they're going to follow a certain behavior themselves. So that's what the vice president did uh, earlier this year when she announced that the U.S. is going to refrain from conducting any uh, destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile tests. So that was just the United States saying, we are not going to do this behavior. We think it is bad behavior. We hope others join us too. Mm. And so with the next steps, we'll see what other countries, even non-country actors in space, if they join and sign on to it. But that's different in turn from uh, going through the United Nations uh, directly for what we had the long-term sustainability guidelines. Those are voluntary, a set of 21 guidelines that a whole slew of, of countries in the United Nations have agreed we're going to do our best to, to follow these to keep space sustainable. And so all of these are different kinds of norm efforts mm. uh, that will hopefully in the bigger picture, move the needle closer towards the goal of safe, sustainable, stable, secure space. Wow. Do you know how that was received in two ways? And I'm, I'm wondering how Space Force received that announcement from the vice president. And I wonder how commercial companies received that message from the vice president, meaning, well, Space Force's job is protect the property that gets put into space. How do you protect it or how do you protect it from debris, right? Unless you can have a policy or have a basis in which you're going to protect it that's defined. And then I would imagine that commercial entities, and this is a whole nother question, if you have good policies, companies will want, customers will want to work with you as a, as a, as a company and say, well, good, you're going to be responsible about how you're putting things into space. You're going to be responsible about how you're going to remove them or keep them um, safe in space or taken down from orbit or however. So I do want to do business with you, even if it's not required. But I wonder how what she said was received on both ends. Can you talk to that a little, if you know? Well, for the first point, uh, if the vice president is making a statement like this, it didn't come out of the blue. Mm -hmm. You know, that this, this is a, a whole of government approach when it's coming from the, the national leadership. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Center for Space Policy and Strategy co-hosted an event with George Washington University where we had a panel, and this was specifically on this announcement by the vice president. And the panel was made up of representatives from the Department of Defense, Department of State, NASA, Department of Commerce, all talking about their perspectives and how this announcement can be moved forward in the future. Um, so, you know, I certainly haven't seen any measure of, of pushback because this is something that the, the whole of government is has put behind it together. And it's important to note that this is pretty specific. It is not 
uh, a commitment uh, even not to develop weapons. It is not to test them in a destructive manner by blowing up a satellite. So, so that's part of the nature of these norm discussions is you have to scope them very specifically in order to take different paths successfully. Mm. So that's the, that would be the answer on the, the first one. Um, and maybe you can <laughs> refresh me uh, on the, the second. Yeah, the commercialization partners and the and the commercial satellite companies and how they will be following in what the vice president says to engage in a, maybe a policy or maybe they design their business model so they have responsibility in how they're putting and placing and then deorbiting their um, pro their products. Yes. Yeah, so several uh, companies did actually put out public statements supporting the, the vice president's announcement. So there was even direct uh, engagement and discussion on that. But that's kind of the point of this paper that I put out a couple of weeks ago is how do you interact with commercial actors on space issues with norms when they have a really wide range of, again, perspectives and interests and motivations and uh, what their duties are to their customers, uh, to fulfilling their, their services, their projects. Um, and so when I look at all of this from a norms perspective, one thing that always comes up is if a norm is something in which a commercial actor has a stake, it's a behavior that affects them and maybe helps to mitigate a potential concern they have. If that norm, costs something to comply with it. So that means that if the commercial actor has to change how they build a satellite or change how they deorbit a satellite in order to comply with it, that's another crucial factor. And then finally, does the commercial actor complying with the norm impact whether that norm is successful? Because mm. there's certain norms that you really only need militaries perhaps to follow along because commercial actors aren't going to be shooting things hopefully um but there are others like how do you communicate how do you share information that it is important if commercial actors are on board and so looking at those three factors if if, if the answer is kind of yes for all of them to whether it matters for commercial then it probably means that commercial actors might need to be involved in the development of the norm, sure. not just kind of receiving it after it's been created. Like because that. you know, if, if you have to follow something and it impacts you and you impact its success, then you probably want to have a say in how that gets developed so that you have better buy-in, better understanding and better agreement with what you're gonna be doing mm. as a norm. Wow. So yeah, complicated answer to say, there's just a lot of directions it can go and therefore participation and dialogue is really important for these norm issues. Oh, I love the answer. Really well, well expressed too. Is space still the wild, wild west? I've never been a, a huge fan of that term. Uh, I've often liked to say that space is a vacuum, but space policy is not. Space diplomacy is not a vacuum. <laughs> uh, law isn't either. Uh, a big of part of the challenge is that there are laws that exist in space. Different countries have regulations, policies, national laws. There are broad norms that aren't even codified but are generally followed. And so the problem isn't that it's, it's empty, that there isn't anything to follow, is that there are overlaps and gaps and contradictions and it's hard to, to navigate sometimes what is the path that is both the best in, in general and that is supported by all of these different policies and laws. So the, yeah, the short us, answer is it's complicated. It's not Sure. Oh yeah, of course. Can you give us an example of one of those overlapping, contradicting um, maybe policies or norms? Oh, I mean, that's such a, a, a big question. Uh, I think part of the challenge is that you have these varying degrees of, of legal commitment. So we have the, the Outer Space Treaty uh, of 1967 sets out some really core principles mm -hmm. about space, but they're also pretty broad. And so then the United States in the last couple of years has been developing the Artemis Accords, mm -hmm. uh, which is a series of agreements involving now over 20 different countries 
And a big part of the Accords is that they provide a little bit more specific interpretation of some of the principles of the Outer Space Treaty. But then if you go to look at discussions in the UN and the uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space or COPUS, there's some back and forth on whether this interpretation is the same interpretation that other countries would have of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and so some of that back and forth kind of continues. And there are other countries who have signed uh, different treaties that are such as the, the Moon Treaty that only has 18 signatories and that has slightly different implications of uses of the moon or activities on the moon than the Artemis Accords, but there are countries who have signed on to both. So, so that's where I say it's, it's complicated, uh, but it's hard to necessarily have the, the black and white solutions on everything. Mm. Um, and that's, I mean, that's kind of why I, I like trying to navigate these, these thorny problems in space yeah. policy. Wow. Do you see in the future a lot of startups and commercial space companies looking to be acknowledging policy and referencing it and incorporating it and using it in their design in the future or using it more as a as needed? Like, okay, we have to be cognizant of this. We will we'll adapt and we'll use it, but we'll use it when we need to or if we need to rather than building it into the policy or can they afford to pick one right now or has to does it have to encompass both that's tough uh, and i think you know the practical answer in reality is that different companies different organizations will do things differently that there there's going to be multiple different approaches to how these norms policies and laws are incorporated into commercial activities the most direct and kind of the, I guess we could say not, not forceful, but very specific route is the regulation. So hearkening back to the Outer Space Treaty, countries are responsible for the space activities uh, of even non-governmental organizations from their, their country. Uh, and they have to authorize and supervise the activities of those organizations. And so you know, in the US, as in many other countries, there are specific regulations that commercial actors just have to follow if they want to get a license. Okay. And so those are, that's one way of the, the kind of directive. But you also talked about the approach of companies voluntarily taking on uh, bigger picture understandings, responsibilities, proactive steps. And I think that that is not only plausible, but something that happens not just in space, but for all sorts of, of companies where individual actors will decide to, to take that extra step for whatever motivation. Mm. Um, and, and so I think you'll, you will see both and that as activities play out in space, we'll maybe see if one approach or the other ends up making a bigger difference, but it's, it's probably too soon to tell. Okay. Interesting. Wow. Well, because we have you and you are the expert, I have some questions that may or may not require some interpretation from you <laughs> about legal and, and a little ethics here. And I'd love to pick your brain and give you three examples that maybe we can have some fun just chatting about and you can pull in your expertise. Does that sound fun? All right. Let's All see. right. Okay. So I've got three crazy examples and then you can jump in and say i'm not touching that or here's <laughs> here's a good here's a good um way that we can pick it apart um a few months ago virgin orbit and virgin galactic um sent a few folks into space and the faa moved the qualification of what defines space they literally said okay it was once at this altitude now it's this altitude is that legal we can just change the places and in, in the atmosphere where we define where space starts and what can, constitutes an actual astronaut this seems like this was a bit messy and i i know virgin certainly did a lot of pushback how did how does that play out in policy and making official things official when we're talking about well you know two years ago you were an astronaut if you went this far, but now you have to go further, higher, um, 
further into the atmosphere. It's crazy. It's I I'm actually not super familiar with that particular case, but what I can say is there is no international agreed upon norm of where space starts. Okay. That's, that is not defined in the Outer Space Treaty. That is not locked in. So it has been up to different countries and organizations to settle on kind of where, where they think space is. Okay. So, so that's kind of the, the big picture context on all of that. That's and good. It, is, it is tough because there are the, the legal angles of you have airspace, which is sovereign to your country, and then space space, which there is no claim of sovereignty. You can't claim any part of space as your territory as a country. And so um, there, there's that legal challenge. There's also mm. the physics-based challenges of when does something count as being in orbit and when are the, the principles of physics actually sustaining sure. you or not just falling straight to earth, but falling continuously around earth as yeah. orbit. Um, so, so there's just enough competing factors, plus the challenge that the way that humans are interacting with space is changing. You know, there are increased numbers of super low orbiting satellites. There are increased numbers of space tourists uh, or different missions that are just popping up into space for a little bit and then coming mm -hmm. back down. Mm -hmm. So from a policy standpoint, you know, we are building the satellite as we're flying it. And <laughs> there are just so many things that you won't fully grasp the implications of from a policy or a, a physics standpoint until there's actually some experience with it. And yeah. so I would expect that, that some of these challenges would remain in, in flux unless there is a concerted normative effort to set it. Interesting. Well, that's a perfect segue into my next scenario for fun. I invent something that goes to space and it can or cannot be applied back on earth maybe it's something as technical as dna sequencing maybe it's something as simple as material science that only really can apply in a space-based environment but not really advantageous back on earth how in the world is that get how does that innovation get defined how does it get enforced how does it get licensed um if it only applies to space for now? Am I required to bring that back and file it when I come home? Is it based on who's flying it? Was it a government payload? Was it a commercial? This has always been a question I've been wondering. And how, how does one even define um, how you need to file that before you even fly it? Because someone's got to fly it and then that's a payload and then you have to you know, label that properly. But once the in invention is made, where does that go? It's, I, I am not a regulatory expert. So I, the, the short answer is I have no idea um, <laughs> yeah. from, from an actual standpoint of what the, the regulations are, you know, from the, the macro level, it does go back to, at the very least, if you're doing an activity in space, then your country is responsible to, to make sure that you're not causing harmful interference to other activities that they're authorizing and supervising it. But it is up to the country to kind of define what that means and how it goes. And I'm just not familiar enough with the uh, regulatory system. Yeah, I can't imagine. It. And I can't wait to see how commercial space stations are going to have to navigate this as things get invented or developed or produced. And they're really only used in a commercial sense at first, but then they get to be purchased or evolved or um, expanded upon. This is going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. um, okay, one last scenario. How about one more just for fun? These are just, right. uh, these are just more of my curiosity. I've always wondered how things work when you launch and they return. When they return, especially now that we're seeing more maritime launches and launch platforms, do we follow international maritime law and rules there when we're, like if it lands um, in the ocean and it's on the barge, but another com 
country could like come pick it up and steal the technology or is it still ours if it's floating on the ocean and can anyone just you know camera that and and record that so they can observe that and learn from that as well or is how are those laws applied do you know so the the way it works from the, the international law standpoint from the outer space treaty and, and some of the subsequent treaties there's a liability convention a registration convention um when a country is a launching state so that means they they do the launch they procure the launch there's a couple of different ways to define it uh the things that they launch are their responsibility basically okay. Even when they come back to, to Earth, once you've launched it, you are you are liable for that object. Um, so this was something that came up um, when there was the the large core stage from a Chinese rocket launch mm -hmm. that was re-entering uh, Earth's atmosphere in a kind of un unpredictable fashion uh, a couple of months ago. I, I, they've done a couple of these launches, and basically, if that piece of debris hits someone on the head or destroys some property, it is the responsibility of the state that launched it to pay damages. They're liable, um, but it is also their object. So if they want it back, they, they get it back. Um, and there's lots of other complications in, in law and policy for how that actually works out, but that's the, the, the baseline for when it comes to, to launching things. So it's from the origin country, regardless of whether it's on the sea, on the land, or in Virgin's sense, like from a plane, they launch it from a plane. Wow, I got it. Are, are you the country that launched it? Are and you the you country? have multiple okay. launching states. Yeah. So if, if one country's paying for the launch on another country's like, rocket, there's, there's a couple ways that that works out. It can get very thorny if you're doing a lot of partnerships, um, but it is the, the launching state is liable. I see. Wow. And as you said before, it's complicated. Oh, uh, my word. Can you hear me repeat that uh, every day of the week? <laughs> I bet. I bet. Well, this has been terrific. I've loved getting to um, enjoy your expertise and your passion when you're not doing law and space. What else? You mentioned your art and your hobbies. Is there anything else that you enjoy that um, people would find surprising? Um, I've already mentioned kind of art and improv. Those are, are two I love that. passions of mine. Uh, I, I grew up a lot in Colorado, so I'm a very outdoorsy person, love hiking and, and rafting and all of that. Um, also a big fan of football. Who's your uh, team? Uh, the Minnesota Vikings. Hey! Oh, can we be friends if I like the Packers? Is this going to work? Uh, I mean, I, the Vikings make me suffer long and hard. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm, I'm used to the pain of, of football. Uh, so it's. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, where can people find you and perhaps even any of your artwork publicly available or out there for us to enjoy? Uh, I, I'll post some art, artwork occasionally on my Twitter, but I'm at Robin underscore M underscore Dickey on Twitter. Um, okay. And then otherwise, if you go to csps.aerospace.org, that's where we put all of our, our papers and our discussions that we have on space policy. And so lots of resources on there from our archive of, of policies that have been published to our exploration of all these different crazy topics on space that are Lovely. so fun to discuss. I love it. Now, before I let you go and thank you again for your time and joining us and entertaining us with your um, vast knowledge and expertise, I love when we get to have women leaders like you show us the many different ways in which you can step into the industry. And you certainly have had quite a unique journey into this industry. What advice would you give for students like you who are literally saying, oh my gosh, I get it. I'm an arts person trying to work in a technical field. What advice would you love to share? Oh, man. Um, I think that some of the lessons that I learned is you really do want to be able to speak other languages if you can. And that doesn't mean Italian necessarily, <laughs> although that's great too. But it means, you know, take a course in how orbital mechanics works, just so that you can understand when someone's talking about how something is impossible to happen in space. You can't do dogfighting with, with satellites because that's not how the physics works. 
having a, a bit more of an understanding of that helps me a lot to, to bridge the gap, just to know the lingo, the acronyms, the, the jargon is, is really important. And then the other one is, is listen to yourself and your feelings when, when you are passionate about something, then pursue it or, or you know, feel out what is something that makes you excited, that you feel that you're accomplishing or that you are just really curious about and feel like you could pursue that curiosity literally past the ends of the earth. And uh, I think that combination of, of some foundation of knowledge, even in stuff you're uncomfortable with and getting to know stuff that, what makes you excited and, and comfortable and, and strong, like all of those things, uh, I think together can help build a, a career path. But it, with space policy, there is no one road. You have to be willing to kind of find that, that flexibility and that sense of what fits, what do I like? Where could I go that maybe could in the future lead somewhere else? Um, so yeah. Great advice. Thank you so much, Robin, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing your work and some more papers and come back and join us anytime. All right, cheers, Beth. It was great talking to you. Thank you.